Hi everyone, I'm Linda Reimer, one of the librarians at the Southeast Bend County Library. Welcome to Library Connections, our weekly readers, viewers, and listeners advisory video cast. Enjoy. Library Connections number 13, hosted by SSCL librarian, Linda Reimer. This video cast is being recorded on Thursday, July 30th, 2020. Kicking things off, we've got the top five books on the New York Times fiction bestseller list. At number one, Near Dark by Brad Thor, the 19th book in the Scott Harveth series. With a bounty on his head, Harveth makes an alliance with a Norwegian intelligence operative. At number two, The Order by Daniel Silva the 20th book in the Gabriel Online series. The art restorer and spy cuts his family's vacation short to investigate whether Pope Paul VII was murdered. At number three, Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. In a quiet town on the North Carolina coast back in 1969, a young woman who survived alone in the marsh becomes a murder suspect. At number four, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. The lives of twin sisters who run away from a Southern black community at age 16 diverge as one returns and the other takes on a different racial identity, but their fates intertwine. And at number five, The Guest List by Lucy Foley. A wedding between a TV star and a magazine publisher on an island off the coast of Ireland turns deadly. And wow, we've got some great action adventure books this week, perfect for summer reading. And moving along to the top five books on the nonfiction bestseller list for this week. At number one, Too Much and Never Enough by Mary L. Trump. The clinical psychologist gives her assessment of events and patterns inside her family and how they shaped President Trump. At number two, The Answer Is by Alex Trebek, who is the Canadian American who got his break on American TV by hosting the game show, The Wizard of Odds, and whose pronunciation of the word genre has been shared widely on social media. Well, that's very interesting. I've never heard Alex Trebek uh, pronounce the word genre, but I'll have to go to YouTube and check that out. And I'm digressing back to the top five on the nonfiction list here. At number three, we've got White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Historical and cultural analysis on what causes defensive moves by white people and how this inhibits cross-racial dialogue. At number four, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps by Ben Shapiro. The conservative commentator describes what he perceives as threats to American history, ideals, and culture. And at number five, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi a primer for creating a more just and equitable society through identifying and opposing racism. Kicking things off with our first recommended read of the week. This one is a mystery. It's the first book in a series. It's called Don't Ever Get Old by Daniel Freeman. Back in the day, bearish buck shots was a renowned Memphis homicide detective. Now long retired, he is asked to visit Jim, an old army colleague who's on his deathbed and wants Buck's forgiveness. Apparently, Jim took a bribe of gold from SS officer Heinrich Ziegler, which allowed Ziegler to escape prosecution. Jewish Buck, who nearly died under Ziegler's torture, is incensed to learn that the old Nazi has been living in the U.S. for decades. 
after a convoluted search that attracts the attention of several individuals who believe Buck will lead them to the fortunate gold Ziegler still harbors, Buck ascertains his victim is his victim, his target, how about, is living in St. Louis. Suddenly, the 87-year-old Buck has roped his grandson Billy, a law school student, into a memorable road trip filled with pathos, bank robbery, and murder. The murderers follow Buck and Billy home again in a particularly gruesome and troubling pattern. Verdict. Short chapters, crackling dialogue, and memorable characters make this a standout debut. With his curmudgeonly lead, Friedman ensues his intergenerational detective story maintains a pitch-perfect tone. The underlying theme of revenge balances a wacky plot that evokes Elmore Leonard. This has a direct topical connection with P.J. Tracy's Live Bait 2, and that's the Library Journal Review. That book is definitely on my to-read list. Moving on to our second recommended read of the week. This one is nonfiction. It's called Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy by Margaret Sullivan. A dire warning on the decline of daily newspapers and the danger that their disappearance poses for democracy. Anyone who follows the media business is familiar with the broad outline of the problem that the author lays out in this unapologetically dour book. Newspapers have shuddered with distressing speed in recent years, more than 2,000 since 2004, she reports, and many of the ones that remain are shadows of their former selves. Sullivan, a media columnist at the Washington Post, used to be the top editor at one of those papers, the Buffalo Evening News, and she shares her own glimpses of the decline. However, the author's goal isn't to lament the good old days of the once mighty business. Instead, she trains her eye on the news deserts that now litter the landscape and voice concern about how corruption will consume communities that no longer have media watchdogs. For instance, the Vindicator in Youngstown, Ohio, used to send reporters to all area school board meetings, a manager told her. And people knew that, and they behaved. But now, TV news and online outlets aren't picking up the slack. And though nonprofit news sources have emerged, they don't have the reach or stability that newspapers once claimed. Combine that with social media platforms that allow misinformation to spread, and it's no wonder local civil discourse has degraded into meme versus meme slap fights. Sullivan is careful to note that this is hardly just an American problem, but the question, of course, is what to do. The author chronicles her discussions with the leaders of some promising startups and considers more radical ideas, such as federal subsidies for media. But her glass is resolutely half empty. She predicts that American politics will become even more polarized. Government and business corruption will flourish. The glue that holds communities together will weaken. The book is a no-nonsense retort to the notion that we live in a time of abundant information. And that review is from the Kirkus Review. Important book. Moving along to our audiobook recommendations of the week, the first one is called Odetta, A Life in Music and Protest, written by Ian Sack and narrated by Rosa Howard. Singer, guitarist, and activist Odetta was born in Birmingham, Alabama on December 31, 1930. She moved with her family to California as a young girl, where a teacher first noticed her stunning vocal talent. She graduated from the local Belmont High School and went on to study music at Los Angeles City College before launching a career in musical theater. And it was while touring with the cast of her production of Finian's Rainbow 
that she began singing folk music and decided to focus her attention on playing the guitar and singing folk songs. She became one of the most prominent singers of the folk revival of the late 50s and early 60s and frequently sang at civil rights protests from the 1960s to the 1990s. Odetta was a great folk singer and this is her story. Check it out. Our second audiobook recommendation of the week is fiction. This one's called The Ten Year Nap, written by Meg Wolitzer and read by Alicia Brushnan. Four female friends living in New York were raised with the idea that there is nothing women cannot do. They can have great careers and families too. The girls grew up, graduated from high school, went to college, and launched successful careers before getting married and deciding to start families. And it was at that last juncture that all four put their careers on the back burner so that they could concentrate on staying at home with their young children. Fast forward 10 years and the girls are approaching 40 and pondering why their lives haven't turned out as they thought they would. They have their families and their children are no longer small but their careers have suffered in the process. Can women really have it all? This is the question they are pondering as a series of unexpected events begins to change their lives in monumental ways. And that sounds like a great summer read and listen. It's available in the digital catalog. Moving along to our streaming video recommendations of the week, the first one is a little bit of an oldie now, much to my surprise, 26 years ago. This is from 1994. It's called Nobody's Fool. It's available on Amazon Prime Video. Paul Newman was nominated for an Oscar for his performance in this well-done comedy drama. Newman portrays a young senior named Sully who has never quite grown up. Sully does construction work part-time to get by. He also rents a room from his eighth grade teacher. He's divorced and hasn't seen his ex-wife or son in years. Oh, and he also has a crush on the wife of the owner of a local construction company who frequently throws work his way. Sully has basically constructed his life so that he has as little responsibility as possible. And he has been content with that lifestyle until he nearly, literally, runs into his son and a grandson he didn't know he had. As the film unfolds, viewers see Sully incrementally, one baby step at a time, decide that it is time to grow up and take responsibility for his life. The film has a positive core because if there's hope for positive change in Sully's life when he is in his 60s, then there is hope for positive change for the rest of us too no matter where we are in our lives. The film has a great cast. In addition to Paul Newman, the movie features Jessica Tandy, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Elizabeth Wilson, Dylan Walsh, Melanie Griffith, and Bruce Willis. It's the perfect film for a hot summer evening. Moving along to our second streaming video recommendation of the week, this one is called Stateless. It's available on Netflix. Stateless is a new miniseries consisting of six episodes. The series was co-created by actress Kate Blanchett, who co-stars, and it follows four strangers who meet at an immigration detention center located out in the middle of nowhere in the Australian desert. And it is notable that in Australia, if you don't have the proper immigration paperwork, you must stay in the detention center until you do. And if you can't get the proper paperwork, you can't leave. The film follows, I said four characters previously, but actually there are five. There are four immigrant characters who are trying to get from one place to another, and then there are a couple of staff members. So the miniseries follows a singing con artist who runs a dance studio, that's Blanchette, Amir, an Afghan immigrant looking for asylum, Sophie, a troubled young woman using an alias, Claire, the center's immigration director, Cam, a new security center guard. 
So those are the main characters. The film offers an interesting character study with a side study of the Australian immigration system. The series is engrossing and perfect to watch while sitting in front of the AC. So if you're looking for an immersing watch, check out Stateless. Moving on to our Odd Duck recommendations of the week. This week I'm going to offer tips on how to sleep better in hot weather from three different articles because it's just that time of year where the light comes in the window super early and most of these tips are for people that don't have central air but even if you do have central air there are certain things that might wake you up early like not having blackout shades in your bedroom so the light comes in and wakes you up at 5 30 which is fine if you want to get up at 5 30 but if you're a night owl like me that's not really helpful so i actually have a sleep mask that goes over my eyes to help block out the light but i'm digressing let's get on to our three articles on how to sleep better in hot weather the first is from the western australia department of health and at the top of each uh, article page here, I have shown you quickly how I would Google it specifically to get the first search result to come up to be this website. So I would Google this sleeping in very hot weather, Western Australia. And then the first search result is this article. So they've got several categories there, what you should do before you go to bed, things to avoid, improving your sleep environment, getting a good night's sleep, preparing for future hot weather and nights, yikes. But I haven't uh, shown all of the subcategories here, just two, sleeping in very hot weather. They recommend wetting your face before you go to bed. And among other things, you could soak your feet in cold water for 10 minutes before going to bed. Apparently that works. That sounds cool. So that sounds good. Things to avoid include exercising close to bedtime, not eating again, or and not eating heavy or spicy food. So no Tai Chin chicken for any of us, you know, just before bed. The second article is from the BBC. And to get there quickly, I would Google hot weather, how to sleep in the heat BBC. And it should come right up and it shows us somebody who obviously can't sleep in the summer heat the sheets are all bunched up there so some of their tips include no napping which is actually good for good tip for most of the year anyway but apparently during hot weather we can feel more lethargic if we nap okay keep to routines use thin sheets chill your socks which i thought was interesting i've never thought of that and stay hydrated. So those are some of the tips from the BBC article. Our final article for the week offering tips on how to sleep well during the summer months is from the Real Simple site. That of course is the Martha Stewart related site. The article is called, This is Why You Can't Fall Asleep in the Summer. And if you Google that with the words Real Simple, your first search result should be this article which offers seven tips for sleeping well in the summer, even if you don't have an air conditioner. And here are a few of the tips. Get a dehumidifier. Take a hot bath before going to bed. Surround yourself with breathable fabrics. Eat light or don't eat anything at least two and a half hours before you go to bed and stick your feet out from under the covers. So there are just a few helpful hints on how you might sleep better during the summer months. My research sources are found in the references section if you'd like to check them out. And here we have our cute cat photos for the week. My three fur babies in one of their favorite spots on my bed during the daytime and on a summer evening. In the photo on the left, from left to right, we've got Winston, Jules, and Piper. And in the photo on the right, we see Piper, who is sort of hard to see her face, but that's her. She's the black kitty. Winston and Jules. And they're just kind of hanging out. If you have questions about this weekly video cast, please send me an email. My email address is rhymerl at stls.org, and I'll get back to you. Library resources you can access from homepage one. 
Here we see the library's website found at ssclibrary.org. And on the right side of the page, we see the Reference Desk online form, which is a way for one to digitally submit requests for answers to reference questions. You can also call the library, of course, but should it be 10 o'clock at night and you want to submit a virtual Reference Desk request, you can do so. Library resources you can access from home page two. Here we see on the left side of the page, StarCat. That's the catalog of physical library materials, including print books, DVDs, audiobooks on CD, that sort of thing. On the right side of the page, we see the schedule and appointment page, which is found at ssclibrary.org forward slash appointment. And that's how you make an appointment right now to pick up holds, drop off books, come in and browse the collection at the annex. So you gotta go to that page, or again, you could call the library Area code 607-936-3713. We're there from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And our third library resources you can access from home page shows us the digital catalog and the RB digital catalog. These collections both feature apps. The digital catalog offers ebooks, downloadable audiobooks, and a handful of streaming videos. There are actually two apps that you can use for the digital catalog, Libby and Overdrive. If you have a newer device, I would recommend you use Libby. You can find the apps, of course, in your app store. And RB Digital, the app is just called RB Digital. It is notable, though, that if you don't have a mobile device of any kind, you can still check out ebooks, audiobooks, and magazines through the web version of these sites. And you see the actual web addresses there. Library resources you can access from home page four. These are the library's blogs. I urge you to check them out. There's a lot of great content. We have a book club for adults. We've got a local history blog. Creation Stationery is the makerspace blog. So there's a lot of creative tips and hints and videos on the blog. And Story Musings is a terrific blog hosted by the library's resident author and head honcho of adult services, Michelle Wells. So I urge you to check that out. Tech and Book Talk is what it sounds like. It offers tips about books that you might like to read and how-to tips on technology. Social media, just a weekly reminder, you can connect with the library and pose questions via social media. The library has pages on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. In relation, each video in this series is available on demand by the library's YouTube page after it has first been shown on Facebook Live. And that occurs on Friday afternoons, of course. And here is the list of references for this week, including the articles that I looked at to come up with the helpful tips for sleeping better in the summer. And finally, on to the tech tip of the week. Hi everyone, this is the tech tip of the week and this particular tip is for iPhone owners. I'm going to show you how to quickly and easily scan documents with the native notes app on your iPhone. Now I say native, what that means is that notes, the app, is on the iPhone when you get it right out of the box. Apple has already installed it. If you've taken it off your iPhone for some reason, you can get it in the app store and restore it but it should be on your iPhone by default. And I like to mention this because I didn't know until recently you could do this and it saves you going to the app store and buying a scanning app and then being told, oh, you gotta pay more money to have more storage. You don't need to do that. So you go to the notes app and I'm gonna open the app now. And if you have a note open, that's okay. You can also go back in the top left hand corner it says notes with an arrow. I can go back to my whole list of notes I've got 81 notes, you'll notice at the bottom. But wherever you are within notes, in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a square with a pencil. It's supposed to be a pencil, I think. A piece of paper and a pencil. Tap that to create a new note. Okay, so this is a blank new note. And you'll notice just above the keyboard, there are a couple of symbols. And the fourth one over is the camera. So that's the one we want because we're going to scan. If I tap the camera, I have a couple of options, and the top one is scan. 
Now I have a document sitting in front of me on the table. It's called Extreme Weather Kitty Pad. Karen instructions. It's you know it's one of those heating pads for cats in the winter. So I type scan document and it will turn the camera on and you gotta hold still. And it should think about it for a moment and it took took a picture of it. So you'll see it says ready for next scan. If you have more, you have multiple pages, you tap the white circle at the bottom underneath that when you're ready. But we've only got one, so I'm going to tap save in the bottom right hand corner. And it has saved it. Now from here, I can go back to notes in the top left hand corner underneath the time. And that will give me my whole list of notes. I can email this or share it with somebody else with the arrow sticking out of the box in the top right hand corner. Or at this point, I could just tap done. So again, if you want to send it to somebody, it's that box with the arrow sticking out of the top of it in the top right hand corner. But I don't want to do that right now. I just want to tap done. So I tap done and it has saved it. So now if I go back to notes by tapping on the notes menu symbol in the top left hand corner, my first item here is my scan document. So that is the tech tip of the week. And that's it for this week, folks. I'll see you next week with another edition of Library Connections. Stay cool and be well.